Today, I want to talk about the Raspberry Pi Pico microcontroller board, not the usual Linux-based microprocessor board that Raspberry Pi Foundation recently launched. Yes, yes, I know, I am more than a month late to the party, but you know, things happen in life when you have a young toddler at hand with plenty of holidays in the short month of February. So I am not going to go through the detailed specs of the Pico board because thankfully there are already plenty of resources out there by now, including some in-depth tutorials on running MicroPython examples on the Pico board, as well as some practical comparisons with similar similar boards such as, you know, ESP32 and STM32. Instead, I want to take a step back and take a long-term broad view of uh, some exciting trends that are happening in the world of microcontrollers. And I feel that Raspberry Pi has jumped onto these good, exciting trends with the launch of their Pico board. So trend number one that I want to talk about is the concept of custom chip design with the launch of RP2040. Uh, trend number two is the user-friendly and open tool chains, especially with the use of the native C, C++ SDK. And we will run through some examples. Like seriously, this was my fastest ever uh, getting to Blinky using a native C, C++ SDK of a microcontroller. And trend number three that I want to go through is this new exciting feature called programmable IO or PIO. And we will use some examples with I2C as well as this NeoPixel WS2812 LED strips, uh, which is a very quintessential example for using with PIO. So I'm pretty excited about these three trends in the microcontroller world, so let's jump right into it. The microcontroller chip on board the Pico is a custom design chip which is designed in-house by the Raspberry Pi engineers, which means it is not from a traditional manufacturer, say Broadcom, Microchip, or even STM Microelectronics. I'm excited about this specific trend of designing a custom silicon and how accessible it is becoming even for a small team to build their custom chip. So other than the traditional chip manufacturers, Apple has a history of designing their own processes based on uh, the ARM architecture for their handheld devices and recently even for their line of Mac computers they are using the M1 Apple Silicon after having a history of using Motorola series in the 1980s to the PowerPC in the 1990s and Intel in the past decade. So you know when you kind of think about building a custom chip, a custom silicon, whether it is for a small microcontroller or even the beefy Apple silicon, I always had the impression that it is really, really challenging. Not only it is expensive, but you might need a big team with various skills. And then a couple of years ago, I heard Bunny Huang at a local conference sharing about his idea of a secure and private communication system based on open source hardware, software, and silicon. And I was like, what open silicon? I've never actually heard of that term until that point. And Bunny went on to explain how a user verifiable silicon might be able to solve the time of check to time of use supply chain attacks. And then fast forward to last year, I finally got to know exactly how one can design a custom chip in a relatively affordable and accessible way when Tim Ansel spoke about the Skywater PDK, which is a fully open source manufacturable process design kit, PDK, for a 130 nanometer process. ASIC is made up of three parts, which are the resistor transfer level RTL design, the EDA tools, and the PDK. PDK data, and they are all open sourced. So do check out the comprehensive documentation at the Skywater website, as well as Google's PDK on GitHub. And if you want to know more in depth, uh, more hands-on course, do check out the course called Zero to ASIC, where anyone can learn to create their custom microchips using free and open source tools. And that finally brings us to the Raspberry Pi, the Pico microcontroller board that they launched. Yes, 
so we can say that you know they have a strong links to a big manufacturers such as Broadcom. They also have a decade worth of experience. But even then, this is the first time they that they are launching something of a microcontroller. And also, the team that designed the custom chip is certainly not a huge one. I think the RP twenty forty microcontroller is mostly open source, and under the documentation, there is a link to the comprehensive set of data sheets. One particular section caught my attention. Why is the chip called RP2040? Well, that's because it has two cores. It has a ARM Cortex M0, so that's the zero, and then RAM is four, and it has zero non-volatile memory on board. So, do you think this uh, this trend of custom chips, this naming convention, will catch on? Well, uh, let's see. All right, I am excited to use the Pico board with the native C, C++ SDK and all the open source tool chain. So we will use the Pico to run a pre-built binary for the Blinky and then install the tool chains to build the binary. We will also use it to run a simple I2C example with two sensors. So before we begin, I must emphasize once again how friendly easy and well documented the entire experience was so so a huge thanks to the raspberry pi engineers for ensuring that the developers have a great experience so all the documentation that we need to understand and run the code on the pico is available on the getting started page i highly recommend going through the documentation getting started with the raspberry pi pico which has the instructions on running the blinky code as well as building on other operating systems uh, like Mac and Windows. Of course, Linux is what they use as the default example because Raspberry Pi. Throughout my experience with the Pico, I also referred to two GitHub repositories. One is containing all the Pico examples and the other one has the Pico SDK. I also found the online documentation of the SDK helpful to search for functions and their definitions. All right, so the road to the fastest Blinky starts with downloading the pre build binary file and we can get that in the uf2 file format either from the getting started page or we can also go to the pico examples and under readme getting started we can download the pre-built uft file so i'm gonna do just that and click here and once i come to the desktop we'll be able to see that file of course uh, right here on my desktop as well so what is uf2 i found it really really interesting it is a file format developed by microsoft for the make code it is also used in microbit for flashing microcontrollers over mass storage devices. Okay, so here's the fun part. We have the microcontroller here, so we will press the boot cell button that is found on the microcontroller and then plug it in into our laptop. And once we do that, we should be able to see it as a mass storage device. This is how it will appear on the desktop as well. And all we need to do is just drag and drop it into the mass storage device. Now, I also like to detect it via the volumes and ensure that Raspberry Pi Pico is detected as a mass storage device. And then after that, simply copy the file from the desktop that I downloaded the UF2 file into the volumes slash Raspberry Pi. And immediately once we do that, the LED will start flashing. That's the fastest way to Blinky. So now that this is done, which is a pre-built binary, why don't we build the binary? So in order to do that, we need to git clone two repositories. So one of them is the SDK. So I'm in an empty folder here in my laptop and I'm just gonna git clone the SDK as well as git clone uh, the Pico examples. So now inside the Pico folder, I have two other directories. So for Mac, I have already installed the packages using Homebrew, which are the CMake, the ARM Embed, as well as the ARM GCC. Now, along with that, I have also ensured that I have uh, enabled the environment variable, which is Pico underscore SDK underscore path. And I have basically put it under my environment files so that I can access this environment variable from anywhere. So once that's done, now I will go inside the Pico examples and Thankfully, the Raspberry Pi team once again has given us so many examples. So the one that we are going to build is the Blink. We need to create a directory called build under Pico examples. And let's just get inside the folder and we will see that the folder is completely empty as of now. And all we need to do is see make dot dot. And now when I list the build folder, there are 
many, many files and folders here. So now when I get inside Blinky, we will see that there are some files that were made. So now all we need to do is run make and it will create all the binary files. And now when we list all the files and folders, you'll find that the bin file is created along with ELF, hex, including UF2. This is the pre-built binary that Raspberry Pi gave us, but we can also build it ourselves. So hey, once again, why don't we click the boot cell and plug it in? ensure that our slash volumes has Raspberry Pi as a mass storage device. Now all we need to do is copy the UF2 file into volume slash RPI2. All right, so now that we know how to build our own binary files from the C code, there are two things missing. Number one, how do we create our own project separate from the Pico examples folder structure? And number two, how do we enable the serial monitor? Maybe we want to just see high, low, high, low from the bin blinking example. So thankfully, once again, in the documentation, getting started with Raspberry Pi Pico, there is a chapter on creating an own project that I referred to. And apart from the individual code here, the one one thing that I am going to do is, is copy this uh, Pico SDK import CMake file. So let me go to my desktop and create a folder called Blinky. And inside Blinky, which is completely empty as of now, I am going to copy this exact file into the current directory. So now I have one file called Pico SDK import.cmake. After that, I'll of course refer to the same example, blink.c, and let me create a file and copy this code, a new file called blinky.c. But a little bit of the code is missing if we want to enable the serial monitor. So for that, we will go to the example, hello world USB. And inside here, we have to do a couple of things. We have to include this function studio in it all and then print f hello world. So maybe I'll print f right at the end. Apart from that, we also need to create the file cmake list. And now my folder has three files. So I'm going to copy exactly the same thing inside the blink example. But to enable the serial monitor, we need to also copy a couple of lines which are uh, given in the CMake example inside the Hello World USB, which are these couple of lines. We need to enable the USB output and disable the UART output. Other than that, we also have to ensure that the file name is exactly the same. So I'm just going to change all the instances of Blink to Blinky and uh, make sure that we do that for every single project. Finally, I have my trusty make file so that I do not forget some of the steps. So this is exactly what we were doing in our previous example. We will create the folder build and then see make and then make. And in terms of flashing, we will also go inside the build folder, transfer the UF2 to the volumes. We are going to sleep for a couple of seconds and then print out the port available. Seems like, of course, when we copy from the example, we also need to change hello USB to Blinky the name, right? So looks like I was missing a few of the lines and I will also remove this because I don't really need it. Looks like I am missing one of the hash include. Right, so let me try it one last time. So let's try this one more time inside my Blinky folder right now. Press the boot cell button and plug in so that under volumes, I do have the Raspberry Pi detected. And now all I need to do is make, which will build the all the binaries once again. And the final thing that it will do is copy the UF2 binary into the volumes of the mass storage device detected. Sleep for a couple of seconds and then detect the new port available, which is right here. And of course, it is flashing the LED here as well. And now when I come to my cool term application to view, I connect via the serial port and hello world is printing. All right, so now that we have built the Blinky project using um, the serial monitor and using our own separate folder, we will use the same pattern of files to make an I2C example. And here we will use a couple of sensors to do a bus scan. We will be using the bus scan example under Pico examples. The first sensor that we'll be using is from Adafruit VCNL 4000 is the one I have, I believe is the older one. And the second sensor is SI702 
similar to one also from Adafruit in an older form factor. So this is the schematic that I have. So here are the two sensors, the SD and the SCL lines are shared and we will be connecting them to GPIO number four and five, which is like sixth and seventh pin from the top of the board. And of course, uh, they all can take in a uh, logic level 3.3 volts, which will be the input voltage. And I will be feeding them from this pin, which is an output power pin. And of course, all their grounds will also be connected. Now, if you look at the pinout, once again, we have to ensure that it is GP4 and 5, which is pin number 6 and 7 from the top. And it is also defined as I2C0 SDA and SCL. So as you can see, you can define a lot of the pins as I2C. So let's make a directory called pico-i2c. And inside here, we're going to create a file pico-i2c.c. But I am going to take this code and let's cut and paste. So I think I will define the pin SD and SCL right at the top and just replace four and replace five. And I will enclose all of this inside a while loop and maybe every two seconds. So I will also use the same CMake list file, but inside the CMake, we should change the name Blinky once again to pico-i2c. And in the target link library, we also have to include the i2c hardware library. And as usual, we have to also include the pico sdk import cmake file. So we have three files now. And finally, the make file, which will be very, very similar. So right now I have four files, the cmake list file, make file, the C file, and the cmake file. So why don't we try to compile it and let's see whether everything is fine. Right, looks like everything is okay. So I have already connected up uh, in the breadboard for the two sensors and the wiring is uh, really, really simple. So I'm gonna just press the boot cell button once again and uh, plug in and make flash should just work. Yep, it is able to copy, sleep twice and we have the port available. So now when we go to our serial monitor and try to connect and yep, here we see the bus scan information that's coming up. So let me disconnect it. And if you look at the one of the scans, we will see that it is 40 and then 13. So what does these numbers mean? Well, if you go to SI7021 sensor and search for I2C address, you will see that one of them has a hexadecimal of 40. Similarly, when we go to the data sheet of the proximity sensor and let's search for address once again, there you see the address here is 13 in hexadecimal, which is once again, exactly what we have derived here. So 10 and 3, which is 13. And the last trend that I'm very excited about is this thing, the programmable IO or PIO that everybody's talking about. I think it's this exciting new feature. So let's uh, hear from the Raspberry Pi engineering team about what is the PIO. And so maybe we can dive right in then. So the, the PIO is something that's been called out as the as a very interesting feature. Can you guys kind of talk through what that is up front? Yeah. So PIO started in summer 17 during, during my internship. There's been an idea kicking around since the 60s of having something that is programmable like a processor, but is very stripped down and specialized to IO. You can have things like FPGAs on board your microcontroller, but they have a high area and power. To be honest, in the exact implementation of the C code using the PIO assembly code to run some code examples, I did find it challenging. And I don't think it's within the context of a video, it will be possible to show every single line of the code and what it means. But for PIO, they are basically two things uh, that we can take away uh, about its potential to do something different from the traditional GPIO pins. Firstly, it is the concept of a flexible peripheral. For example, if you want today one UART and one I2C versus say tomorrow using the same hardware, for UART and one I2C, it is possible using the PIO. Under the PIO example, if you look at the folders, we will see there's PWM, SPI, Blink, Square Wave, and of course the WS2812 NeoPixel example. And this basically tells us flexible peripherals are possible with just PIO. The second uh, advantage in using a PIO is that we are able to offload some 
timing critical, uh, non-standard protocols that are taking up the entire microcontroller that are that is keeping the microcontroller busy, we can sort of offload it. And that example can be shown with uh, WS2812NeoPixel, which has a non-standard protocol. All right, so for PIO, we will use the I2C example and we will do the bus scan. But notice how for the PIO example, there are three extra files. One is called the .p PIO and it is written in the PIO assembly language and this is where I did find it a little challenging. I do believe that it will take us a little bit more time to understand all these functions and there is also the PIO I2C header file and the implementation file. So first what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to the bus scan file and copy the code locally. So mkdir maybe PIO-I2C and new file I'll say PIO I2C.C. Let's paste the code here. So under SDASCL, I will put it as 4 and 5, which is exactly the same as the previous example. Now notice here under main, in the GPIO I2C example, here you see that the GPIO is setting the function SDASCL, whereas in the PIO, we are looking at how a PIO program is added, and then we are initializing the I2C program. So once again, I'll do something very similar. I'll put it under a while loop that will repeat itself and it will repeat every two seconds. So apart from the C file, I will copy the three extra files, which are the PIO assembly language file and implementation of the PIO I2C and the header file. Let's look at the C make list file. And here we have to be a little careful about adding these lines to generate the PIO header and the target sources will also have more files along with the target link libraries. Right, so this is how my CX CMake file looks like. Firstly, of course, there's the version. Then I include the CMake file and the project name with the Pico SDK in it, add executable. This is the PIO header. The sources has more files and I will once again put the two liner to enable the USB and disable the UART. And as always, we need to import the external SDK import CMake file and my make file will be exactly the same. That's quite a lot of files, but once we get to one project, it should be easy to edit and move on and customize it for the other project. So my make file is exactly the same. Let me fix this line. Should be target link libraries. Right, let's try again. Okay, looks like there is no error so far. And in the build folder, I have all the files generated, including the UF2. So this time, as usual, we are using I2C, but via the programmable IO. So once again, I'm going to press the boot cell button and then plug it in and then simply do make flash. All right, the port has come up and let's see what happens. We should see exactly the similar thing, but this is using a PIO I2C bus scan. And the second example is about NeoPixels. Uh, so these are individually addressable LEDs and uh, we can control all of them. And in this case, I have 60 of them in a row by a single microcontroller pin. In terms of NeoPixels or WS2812, I highly recommend checking out Adafruit's NeoPixel Uber guide. Now, one big thing about using NeoPixel with the Raspberry Pi Pico board is the logic level difference. NeoPixel runs on five volts, whereas the Pico board is running on 3.3 volts. So there is once again, a very, very good article on Adafruit explaining how to connect these two via a level shifter. So this is the diagram that they have given with the example of another microcontroller board, but the concept is very similar when we use it with a Pico board. So be sure to use it with a level shifter. The level shifter that I am using is something that I got off AliExpress. It is a very, very easily available module. So the single microcontroller pin is GPIO0 that I'm using, and it will be going to the low voltage side of the level shifter. And on the high voltage side, it will be connecting to the data pin of the first LED of the entire NeoPixel strip. Similarly, I have uh, connected all the grounds together 
be sure to connect all the three grounds of the three components. Finally, in terms of the power supply, I have connected VBUS of the Pico pin, which comes directly from the micro USB, and hence it is 5 volts, to the power supply of the NeoPixel. But the 5 volts is also connected to the level shifter in the power supply of the high side, but on the low side, I have connected it to the 3.3 volts output pin of the Pico. So once again, if you look at the pinout, this is GPIO0, exactly the first pin of the Pico board. I have also used the VBUS pin for 5 volts and the 3.3 output power supply in pin number 36. And this is how the actual setup looks like on a breadboard with the level shifter connected to the Pico as well as NeoPixel 60 LED ring. I have also linked it to the logic analyzer with just two probes connected to the ground and pin one. All right, so let's look at the software that I'm running from the C, C++ SDK. It is under the Pico examples, PIO and WS2812. So in this folder, you will see the familiar files such as CMake, uh, list.txt which I have used. There is also the assembly language for PIO in terms of WS2812.PIO file. Now we do not need the parallel program. What I have done is I've taken this program and if you run it by itself you will find a lot of patterns like random patterns, sparkle pattern, gray pattern used and they will basically uh, cycle through the different patterns but we will run something very very simple. All right, so locally, it looks very, very similar. Once again, we have the CMake list file, we have the SDK import file and the assembly language file, but this is the file that we will look at. So here you see, I have connected to pin TX0 and I have a couple of functions defined to just put the RGB color. And inside the main function, this is where I am defining the PIO function. And inside a while loop, I am putting the RGB pixels. So I'm cycling through about seven colors, red, blue, green, purple, cyan, white, and finally black or all off. And I'm putting a 500 millisecond delay. So this will only light up the first LED. And after that, I am sleeping and turning off everything. All right, so the process is very, very similar. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna press the boot cell and plug in my USB. And simply I'm gonna do make, which will do the compiling and the flashing at the same time. So yep, it is building all the binaries and it is done. It is copying the binary to the detected mass storage and a new port is available. And now we will see the first LED cycling through the red, green, blue, cyan, yellow, and all off. So interestingly, I've also captured it uh, using my trusty Salia logic analyzer. So here you can see the seven colors here. Why don't we say uh, zoom into the red LED being displayed? So this is where you will see that NeoPixel runs on a non-standard protocol. It's not using I2C or SPI or any other protocol. So here you will see this waveform, which is obviously decoded into digital form uh, by the logic analyzer. So if we look at the data sheet for WS2812, here we will see that the composition is made up of 24 bit data, starting with green, then red, and then blue. So that's why you can imagine that the first eight are green, which is completely off, and then the red is high, which makes sense, and blue, and then there is a little bit of the reset code. So now let's look at how the cascading of the LEDs are done. So instead of displaying only the first LED, we will display a few of them. So I'm gonna just remove the 500 millisecond delay. And this obviously means that it's gonna cascade and it's not gonna be red, green, blue, purple, cyan, white. So once again, I am going to press the boot cell and plug in my USB and run make. All right, and it is uploading and the port is detected. So here you can see that the LEDs are being cascaded, of course, because I have not made the colors very specific in the code. So it's just cascading down without us really knowing what colors we will get. But you can see that they are just being displayed and then they will all turn off. Once again, if we 
probe the option B code, we will see that it will just have uh, one signal captured every one second. That kind of makes sense because I have completely turned off all the delays here. And let's zoom into one of them. And here you will see all the signals appearing together. And once again, this is explained in the data sheet by the cascade method. So you can see the data transmission appears in this waveform where D2, D3, D4 will be added on with the colors. So the data of D1 is sent by the microcontroller through the same pin, but D2, D3, D4 through pixel internal reshaping amplification. All right, so those were the three key trends, some exciting trends that I see in the world of microcontrollers, the custom chip design and how accessible it is becoming, the open source and user-friendly development tools, and thirdly is the programmable I.O. that the Pico has also joined in. Now I did take a little bit longer time because I decided to get into the native C, C++ SDK and sort of get my hands dirty. But I guess this is completely normal if uh, we want to get into a new ecosystem of a new microcontroller. But nevertheless, the learning that I did was well worth it. And I will definitely keep a lookout on this Pico board as the ecosystem matures. So I hope uh, you learned something out of this video and see you in the next one.